Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Self Helpless. I'm Kelsey Cook, and today I'm going to be doing a solo episode, and I'm going to be giving you all of my moving tips because I calculated it, and I have moved nine times in the last 10 years. Some of those moves have been within the city that I've been living in. Some of them have been from one state to another, you know, kind of bigger moves. And I just did that recently. At the beginning of the year, I moved from Washington State to Minnesota. And I feel like I've kind of got it down as much, I think, as I can. I've, I've learned a lot of uh, tips and tricks over the years, a lot of things that I think can really streamline the moving process. So I wanted to share a bunch of moving tips with you that I have. Um, that way, if you've got a move coming up, then hopefully it will help. I feel like a lot of our listeners are uh, maybe 30s-ish, maybe 20s. And I do feel like you have a lot of moves in those years. So even if this is not something that uh, is in your immediate future, maybe this episode can be helpful for you to refer back to uh, when you do have an upcoming move. This episode is coming out on Monday, April 10th, which is my birthday. Uh, I didn't even realize that my birthday was on a Monday until recording this episode. It's uh, February as I record this, but you guys know we always record uh, in advance so we have enough time to edit and get everything together and all of that. But uh, yeah, I hope I'm having a good birthday when this comes out. I'll be 34 crazy. I feel like we started this podcast when I was just a wee child and now I feel like an old, old woman. <laughs> but uh, 30s have been great. I will say if you're in your 20s and you feel like it can't get any better, I'm definitely one of those people that like I thought my 20s were fucking sick. Just the best time, you know, having a great life. And now in my 30s, I'm like, oh, 30s are, 30s are nice because you can still have fun, but you're wiser. You're smarter. I feel like you, you party in a, a smarter way um, and uh, probably just make better life decisions in general. But I also, uh, for my birthday, I will be in Costa Rica as this comes out. I'm so excited. My friend Rachel is getting married down there. And I've never been to Costa Rica before, but um, take it a week-long vacation to go celebrate and be there for the wedding. And ooh. Can't wait to tell you guys about it. I hope it's incredible. I feel like everybody who's been to Costa Rica has a life-changing experience there. You know, it's like Costa Rica, Hawaii. I feel like once people go there, they're always like, oh, it's the most magical place I've ever been. So I'm very excited. When I come back from Costa Rica, I will be in Rosemont and Chicago on tour. I believe that is the, ooh, let me do some math in my head. What would that be? Would that be the... You know, I, why don't I just look at my poster? I always have my show dates pulled up when I'm recording, but I just uh, thought I could thought I could wing it because I've got a lot of them memorized, but apparently not these ones. So let's see. Um, so I come back from Costa Rica. I will be in Rosemont April 20th. I will be in Chicago April 21st through the 22nd. Denver April 27th through the 29th. And then in May, I'll, I will be in Uncasville and Salt Lake City, uh, Burbank in June. I also, as this is coming out, will have just been in San Francisco, and I hope that that was incredible. We've got like a ton of RSVPs so far, uh, at least in February, and man, I'm excited. Punchline in San Francisco, one of my favorite places to perform. So if, uh, if you helpsters came out, telling you thank you right now, and uh, yeah, I think, I think that's it for, for tour announcements. Please go to KelseyCook.com, get those tour day tickets. Also, have you watched my special, The Hustler? Because it's out. It's been out now for about a month. Uh, you can watch it for free on YouTube if you want to support a little bit. You can purchase it on my website. Again, that's KelseyCook.com. You'll get a bundle. You'll get like a signed poster, free audio download of the special. So there's some, some little fun goodies you get when you purchase it. And honestly, either way, 
either way is very supportive. I really appreciate you guys watching this special. So, so do that if you can. And oh, can you hear? Can you hear Poe barking in the back? This is something I'm going to talk about. This episode is <laughs> part of the move, moving process, especially if you and your partner are moving in together. That sometimes there is a merging of pets, and so now I am a I'm a dog mom. I'm a, a dog mom to a golden doodle. So let's get into some of these tips. The first thing I would recommend, because I feel like this is something that um, can get kind of lost in the shuffle, and sometimes there are negative consequences to that, I would say uh, make sure that you are notifying your landlord. This is, of course, if you are renting, but I feel like a lot of us um, around this age are still renting. Make sure you notify the the landlord or the apartment complex that you're moving and make sure you know what the potential consequences are of breaking your lease early. Um, I know for me that a lot of the moves I've made have not always lined up perfectly with the lease that I'm currently in ending. Um, that was the case with my move from Washington to Minnesota. And, you know, it did suck that there was a, a break in the lease fee. There usually is. But I just think it's something that it's important for you to get that information um, as early as you can so you can make sure that this is something that you are ready to take on. Um, if it's not, then kind of figuring out, okay, like, am I able to stay here through the end of my lease? But just kind of getting that all sorted out with your landlord, especially because they require often um, usually like a, at least a three to four week notice that you're going to move out without also being penalized. So just keeping that on your to-do list, making sure you've got that all figured out. I know for me, when I'm thinking about a move, I'm kind of focused on all of the um, the stuff for like the place I'm going to and the moving process itself. And sometimes we forget to kind of tie up those loose ends that uh, would include like figuring out if there's a penalty for moving out early. So just make sure you're on uh, on top of that with your landlord. The second thing I would also put on that list that we can forget to do and that can be a little stressful if it gets too close to the time is make sure you set up mail forwarding. So I always just do this through usps.com. They make it really simple. You can just Google USPS change of address or mail forwarding and that way you're not in a scramble to like notify every potential business or company that you receive mail from like it's it's so much easier to set up mail forwarding the typical one they give you lasts for two months i believe you can extend it if you want but that two month buff that two month buffer is a really nice time to make sure that you're not having any mail sent to the old place it's all still coming to you and in that same line of thinking i would get on top of uh, changing your address with all of the billing companies that you work with. So like your credit cards, uh, anything like that, anything where you are receiving important mail, um, maybe your health insurance, stuff like that. Just get in there. That's one of my least favorite things to do about moving is updating my mailing address with bank accounts, credit cards, anything like that. But do it uh, sooner rather than later so you've just got that peace of mind that everything is taken care of, that you're not missing out on important letters, pieces of mail, all of that. And then, uh, okay, so those are kind of some bookkeeping things. So with moving in the act of it itself, uh, like furniture and all of that, it really does, I have found, depend on like if this is a within a city move, if this is an out-of-state move and you're going to use your car or you're going to fly, I feel like anytime I have looked at moving quotes for out of state moves, it's always more expensive to use that than to just buy new furniture. Uh, I would rather sell the furniture I have and purchase new furniture once I get to my destination than use the shipping companies. I feel like Shipley is a really popular one and I think, I guess it depends. If you've got a lot of furniture that is like extremely, extremely valuable to you, maybe it was super expensive and to you, you feel like the price of that is worth paying for the moving cost. I've heard that Shipley is great. Just for me, that has not been the case. I have always found it to be more cost effective to sell what I have and then buy new furniture when I get there. Facebook Marketplace 
is surprisingly great for that. Uh, I avoid Craigslist, although, you know, I know that Craigslist does work. It just can also feel a little sketchier. Uh, Facebook Marketplace and OfferUp are both really, really great sites for selling your furniture. I was able to sell, I think, virtually every single thing that I had wanted to uh, before this move to Minnesota. And I will say that there are certain things you're probably going to have to ask for a lot less money for than you would like to, but it's kind of the nature, I think, of that, um, of the selling, buying furniture environment. It's like people are looking to buy things at a much lower cost than you purchase them. So for example, I had one of my like treat myself purchases when I had moved to Washington was I got myself a Joybird couch and Joybird couches are, you know, they're, they're nicer. They're, they're more expensive, but I had always like bought, I don't know, just like really sh- shitty cheap ones from Amazon or wherever. I was always still up until very recently kind of buying furniture that was for college dorm rooms and not feeling comfortable buying like nicer furniture as an adult. So this Joybird couch was a little bit of a splurge for me, a treat myself. And I was anticipating having it for a long time, but then ended up making the move. And I was pretty sad that I had to sell it for like, oh my gosh, dramatically less than what I had purchased it for. I think we're talking like, I don't know, almost a couple thousand dollars less than what I bought it for. And it was uh, like a year old, perfect condition. So this is just, I was surprised by it. So maybe me telling you guys will help you be less surprised if you find yourself in that same situation. I think what is important is that your furniture ends up selling rather, even if it's for a lot less than you bought something for, than for it to be stuck with you. And it's like the day before you have to be completely out of your apartment and you've got like a massive bed or a massive couch. And then you might end up having to pay a company to come pick it up and move it to the dump, then you're like really, truly losing money. So I, uh, I would just give yourself a lot of time. That's definitely one of my biggest tips with moving in general is give yourself more time to prepare for this move than you think you need, both in packing and you know cleaning your apartment, all of that. But if you're going the selling your furniture route, if you're, if you're moving out of state, just really know that some of those pieces don't sell overnight or even within a week. The The couch was a tough one for me because it I think it was listed for like two weeks before it was sold. And I have I had to just keep dropping the price lower and lower and lower. And I was like, God damn it. This is like so, so cheap now compared to what I bought it for. But I was ultimately happy that I did get some money for it and didn't have to um, like completely lose money by having a company just come pick it up and take it to a dump. So um, try to start earlier than you think with selling your furniture if that's the route you have to go. If you are moving within a city and you're not selling furniture, I have used college hunks before, which I know is such a silly name, but they are nationwide and they are so nice. They did such a great job. I really liked working with them and they made the process really easy. So, um, you know, we're not sponsored by them or anything like that, but just a shout out to College Hunks. If you're looking for a good moving company, I had a really positive experience with them. Now, if you are um, moving out of state and you are looking to ship your possessions like outside of furniture, let's say it's clothing, home decor, kitchenware, stuff like that. I had done a lot of research into, okay, is it better to do like FedEx? Is it better to do USPS? Is it better to check bags on a plane if you're flying to your destination? I found that I had a little bit more peace of mind using FedEx. I will say it's a little bit more expensive to ship your things with FedEx, but they kind of give you... I felt peace of mind through every step of it. There were so many uh, online tracking things. The people I worked with at each FedEx just really felt like they knew what they were doing. And if you're shipping things that are 
near and dear to your heart, maybe that's photo albums, things that are irreplaceable. I felt like it was worth it to spend a little bit more and have it be shipped in a way that I, I felt more confident about. I will say if you are shipping boxes of books, USPS has um, a flat rate, I believe, for books because those can be such heavy boxes. The Definitely the cheapest way to ship books and things of that nature are through USPS. So I would recommend them for things like that. What I ended up doing in this move is I had made a couple trips to visit Chad uh, while we were long distance. And on Delta, I can check three bags for free. I don't know if you guys have an airline that you prefer, maybe it's a program that you have um, miles with or anything like that. But I, I know on a lot of airlines, they do this. And even if you don't have um, checked bags available for free, usually the cost to check a bag is cheaper than shipping a box through FedEx or UPS. So what I had done, I had taken a couple trips here leading up to the move itself, and I had checked three giant bags of, you know, clothes, things that were easier to put in a suitcase. You know, there are certainly things that you wouldn't want to, I think, check a bag because like the bags are getting kind of tossed around. So I would never recommend putting fragile things in a checked bag, but things like clothes, things like that definitely would be a great thing to try the checking the bag route for if uh, the move is involving flying at all. Cars, packing up cars, obviously this is very different. You don't have to deal with this sort of a thing, although you might be, you might have more things that will fit in your car and then you do have to go the the shipping route. But yeah, um, I definitely felt like checking bags was a bit of a, a saver for me. And don't underestimate the importance of bubble wrap. You can go to Home Depot and get tons and tons, like big rolls of bubble wrap. You can buy boxes there if you don't have. I, I When I knew I was about to move, I had started to hold on to boxes that I would receive, you know, uh, like anything in the mail. I would just hold on to those boxes and then reuse them. But Home Depot or Lowe's, those are fantastic places to go purchase boxes for pretty cheap. You can purchase packing tape and bubble wrap there. But yeah, really, if it's like a fragile box, bubble wrap that really well, write fragile all over it. Just do your best to try and keep that stuff safe. This is um, a word of warning against storage units. So when I moved from California up to Washington State at the end of 2020, I had thought that I was going to be moving back down to LA. You guys know, uh, after now hearing the dementia episode about my mom, that things like my plans just changed dramatically because of that. And I ended up living in Spokane for two years. But I, uh, I had put things in a storage unit in LA, like furniture, I put a foosball table in there. I put uh, things in there thinking that I would move back down. And what ended up happening is that that accrued, oh my God, the cost of that for, cause I, in order for me to empty it out, I had to make trips down to LA and try to coordinate selling furniture with people while I was there. It was such a pain in the ass. I it ended up getting fortunate eventually that one of my friends was moving and she wanted new furniture. So she ended up buying the majority, majority of it from me then but all of the months that passed between that point and when I got it, I'm, I mean, I spent thousands of dollars to put a roof over things that I never ended up using. It's, it's definitely a, re a regret I have, and it was a learning lesson. And I know that Delaney, Delaney is so good at uh, doing all the minimalism stuff, all the decluttering trying to decide, okay, what is the actual value of this for me? Is it worth holding on to? And storage units are, it's, it's a great way to kind of question those things because sometimes we go, oh, like, you know, maybe I don't have room in my apartment, but I love this stuff. I'll keep it in storage. And it's one of those costs that I think can just build and build and build in the background of our lives without us realizing it. Uh, we, my brother and I 
had cleaned out my mom, we had cleaned out my mom's storage unit a few months ago. And I think my mom's generation is especially prone to like hoarding and just feeling like kind of that collecting mindset of like, well, this could be valuable someday or, oh, this is so sentimental. I think especially if you are a parent, you also tend to be really sentimental with your kids' things. But God, we found like, we found my mom's first grade homework. So we're talking like (laughs) 65 year old pieces of paper that say one cow plus one cow equals two cows. She grew up in Idaho. This is very spot on uh, <laughs> homework for kids from Idaho. It's just all livestock. But we, my brother and I were looking at each other like, oh my God, mom was spending so much money, again, putting a roof over a piece of paper that is adding up cows. Like this is, we, we have to try to be better, I think, than um, our parents' generation about understanding like, okay, what is realistic to hold on to and what is the actual value of this. Now, I am not as cutthroat as Delaney in terms of getting rid of things. Delaney, I think, doesn't own physical photo albums anymore. I think she has scanned and digitized her entire photo collection. I think they're all like in digital photo frames or hard drives. That freaks me out a little bit because, and which I know it's like, well, your actual photos, your physical photos are kind of vulnerable anyway. Like, God forbid something happens, that's the only copy you have. I do think it's smart to scan them and digitize them. But I don't know, I'm afraid I would like lose the hard drive or something. It's, both are risky, I guess. But I'm not cutthroat enough to get rid of my physical photo albums. So that is something that even though it's such a pain in the dick to like move with photo albums from city to city, state to state, because those are like clunky, they take up space. But to me, they're invaluable. And that actually is worth the shipping cost, whatever it is. I also found I have a collection of CDs. And listen, do I even own a CD player anymore? No, I, I couldn't even play them. If I wanted to, I would have to purchase an actual CD player on Amazon or something. But they just have such great memories for me and like the album covers and it's such a it's such a nostalgic thing that I can't get rid of my CDs. I also have like a box with, you know, butterfly clips and <laughs> shit like that and for some people that might absolutely be trash. It's like what are you doing? Why are you taking up any space in your home with CDs that you can't play? But for me, they really do spark joy and I think that that whole Marie Kondo concept is just crucial when you're getting ready to move, going through your belongings and being like, does this spark joy? How much money am I willing to spend to transport this item from point A to point B? Is it replaceable? If it's not, do I want to be carrying this around for the next 40 years? It's just Moving can be stressful, but I think it's also a really great time to take inventory of your life and of your belongings and the things you're choosing to keep in your space every day and decide if you want to take that with you to your next destination. It's also, I think with clothes in particular, a great time to go through and decide, hey, like, have I just been holding on to this because I've had it for a long time? I'm used to having it in my closet or do I actually like it? Do I like how I feel in it? Again, does this spark joy? And moving is exciting because it's a new chapter of your life. And I think sometimes the clothes we wear can kind of represent an older version of ourselves. So if there are clothes in your closet that are kind of low self-worth items, you know, those pieces of clothing you put on and you just kind of like, it's almost like you're being mean to yourself when you put it on subconsciously, where like you are just choosing to not look your best that day, to not feel your best. If you have pieces of clothing like that, get rid of them. You don't need them. Make room for new stuff. Uh, I made so many trips to Goodwill before the move. I just kept filling up my trunk. And that's a good feeling too. It feels good to donate. So if it's stuff that you're ready to part with, moving is a great time to do that. Uh, In that also same category, decor, I have found one of the hardest things to move for me are framed things. So 
framed posters, framed artwork, framed photos. Framed photos are a little easier because they're smaller, but it's tough when you're in a place you want to make it feel like home. And I think for a lot of us, that means framing artwork, framing posters, but in a move, they're such a pain to move because they're, they're large. So whether you're trying to stick them in a car, that means they're going to take up a lot of room. If you're going to try and ship them, that it's expensive and it's also very fragile and likely to break in the move. So I had to kind of make a game time decision on this most recent move where I ended up taking my artwork that I loved that I knew I didn't want to part with. I took them out of the frames, got rid of the frames, which was a bummer because, you know, frames aren't always cheap. But I tubed them up and then I shipped them in a tube rolled up. It was safe that way. They, they weren't going to get crushed. No glass was going to break because it was just the posters, posters itself rolled up. And I would say uh, I, I don't regret doing that. Does it suck to have to repurchase frames? Yeah, but it was going to be so expensive to ship them. And I think if you're struggling with that, I have just found that rolling them up and shipping them in a tube is... I think the easiest way to go. And I know we talked about this on an episode, maybe a few months back, but decor is also a time to be like, have I just been taking this poster with me from move to move since I was in my college dorm room? Like, do I actually still even like this or is this just out of habit? So yeah, take inventory of your stuff, decide if it still feels worth it to take with you to your, uh, to your new destination. Now, This, again, might not apply to all of you, but if you're moving pets, there are some things to consider. I have moved my cats uh, in a car multiple states, and I have also flown with them. I now, after doing the moves I've done, I don't think I would ever do a cross-country move in a car again. This most recent time um, that I moved from Spokane to Minnesota, I ended up selling my car and getting a new car when I got here and that meant I was going to be flying with my cats and with the rest of my belongings. I, uh, let's see. So when I moved from Seattle to LA, God, what was that? Eight years ago, a very long time ago. That's a long, like maybe an 18, 20 hour drive. So to do it with two cats, you end up usually finding a halfway point, staying in a hotel it's such a long time for them to be in the car. And even though I think cars might be a little less scary for an animal than a plane, because it's not quite as loud, it's just such a long time for them to be out of their comfort zone. You know, it's, I think it's tough on their bodies. They're not getting to use the bathroom in a regular way. They're kind of only getting to once you get to your destination and put out a litter box. Dogs, I know, are... I think easier. You can just bring your dog in your car and, and they can kind of, uh, you know, hop out and pee on the side of the road (laughs) whenever they need to. But for me with cats, I just knew I was like, I don't want to do 20 hours in the car again. And even if I didn't have cats, I don't think I would want to do a long drive like that. So for me, it made sense with how I was feeling about my car. I, I was ready to get a more winter appropriate car for Minnesota So I ended up doing the plane thing, and I will just let you guys know, if you've never flown with a pet before, this is my first time doing it with the cats, and you have to call the airline ahead of time. So when you purchase your tickets for yourself, your seats, then you also have to call. There's no like way to do it online, unfortunately. You have to call, request that you want this. It is, um, it's like $105, I believe, per pet. And that way you can bring them with you as a carry-on item. They count as a carry-on. You can't do them separately. So I had um, I had a cat and a purse. Chad had one of my cats and his backpack. And that's kind of how that works. It just if you're curious, you have to have them in a carrier that is the right dimensions, a, a standard, uh, what are they called? Not cloth carrier. They, they don't like ones that are hard plastic because they want them to be able to fit easily under the seat and maybe have like a little squish to them. So that's what I learned about that. I also went to the vet uh, ahead of time because I wanted to get something that would help the cats 
feel more calm. Obviously being on a plane is, it's very loud. It can be cold. It's just not, it's not great. By the way, I would always recommend flying with your pet on the plane with you, like as a carry on, if you can, as opposed to where I like you check them almost as a bag and they fly below, like beneath you. I, I have just heard horror stories about that. I think it's not a great situation. I think just always, if you can try to bring your pet on the plane, if you're moving them. But I went to the vet to get them some anti-anxiety medicine and she gave me gabapentin, which humans take as well for anxiety. And I would just recommend asking, um, like if you have a picky pet, cause she had, was it a pill form? I think she had initially, the vet had given it to me in pill form. It was like, yeah, just like wrap it in cat food. I don't know about you guys, but my cats can smell if there's anything off about, like there's no sneaking a pill to them. There's no amount of food you can wrap a pill in. Like they will know and they won't eat it. So I asked instead for gabapentin in liquid form, just it will come in little um, syringes. And that way you can just hold your cat kind of like open their mouth a little bit and uh, squirt it down by their gum and then they swallow it. And that it did help. I will say it did work. The problem was our flight was delayed. And so we had given them the gabapentin at the time the vet said, which was like, I think an hour prior to takeoff and it was supposed to last the flight, but because our flight was delayed, we had already given them the gabapentin. And then about halfway through the flight, it was uh, a little bit of like (laughs) a scene out of zombie apocalypse movie where Mia was fully, like fully spazzing, trying to rip open her cat carrier, kind of losing her mind. So that wasn't great, but that was really the only hiccup in, in moving them on a plane. I would I would do that a hundred times over than taking them on a 20 hour car ride. It's, it's just too much. So yeah, that was the moving the pet part. Uh, a few more, a few more tips before I wrap this up. Like I mentioned with letting your landlord know and mailing, uh, I'm sorry, setting up mail forwarding with USPS start so much sooner than you think. Even this past move, I, I felt like I was more on top of it than I had ever been. And I still like the day of was scrambling like the day of the actual move, because it's a little like a wedding checklist. When you're about to get married, there are, there are websites like the knot and stuff like that, that tell you, okay, here's your, here's your year checklist. And it will tell you, okay, these are the things you start doing nine months out from the wedding. Here are the things you start doing three months out. Here are the things you do the week of, here are the things 48 hours before, because there are certain things that you can't do way in advance. And it's the same thing with moving. So things like deep cleaning your apartment, which a lot of apartments require of you is to clean before you move out. So you don't get, um, charged a cleaning fee. But in order to be able to do that, all of your furniture has to be moved out, which then is why I'm saying like, try to get ahead of your furniture being gone sooner than you think because you don't want a place that's full of furniture still when you have to deep clean it because it's just you're going to have a harder time give yourself more time than you think to deep clean also I always think like oh this will take like 15 minutes and then it's just it's a whole thing so give yourself that extra time you don't want to be in that panicky mode of staying up till like four in the morning the night before because it, you didn't realize how much shit you had. Like we all, even if you are more on the minimalist end, we all have so much more shit than we realize. Every time I move, I'm like, oh yeah, you know, I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep it real streamlined and real simple in this next place. I'm not going to get a bunch of things. And then over time, if a place really becomes your home, you do often end up with more physical items there than you had when you moved in. And if you're taking them with you, it just does, it takes a while. So it's, I think the number one thing you could do for yourself to keep your stress low with moving is just give yourself as much time as possible. Make a checklist. Checklists have saved, saved my ass in moving just to really know that you're on top of everything. 
um, selling a car is something I had to do. And uh, that's a whole other can of worms. I don't know if I really need to get into that, but I would also add that to your list of priorities. If you are selling a car before a move, give yourself way more time than you think you need because transferring titles, all of that sort of DMV stuff, I'm in it right now, uh, even still trying to like get this whole thing switched over and it's definitely a headache. So give yourself a lot of time with that. And I think that's it in terms like of a moving checklist. We're in the process now of trying to introduce uh, Chad's dog Poe with my cats. And that's not enough for its own episode, but I will say it's been really interesting because all of the things online when you're introducing cats and dogs, they always tell you like, oh, keep them separated for like a week where they're able to smell each other under the door, feed them at the same time on the on the opposite sides of the door so they can associate being fed and a positive thing with smelling each other. And what I've learned and what I think is true for most people is like, we don't have the luxury of time to be zookeepers or whatever, like animal trainers Where it's like, yeah, keep your cats in a room. It's like, I can't keep my cats in one room for a week. Like, that's just not realistic for us. So we did it. We kept them apart for like, I don't know, maybe two, three hours with letting them sniff under the door. And then we just ended up opening the door and have been trying to navigate it. But uh, it ain't easy. If you guys have any tips, actually, I would really love to know if you have tips on having dogs and cats get along because they are still not too sure of each other and I would love for it to be those like unlikely animal friendship videos where they start to love each other and cuddle but so far has not uh, has not been the easiest so let me know if you guys have tips for cats and dogs getting along but whoo man as always every time I do a solo episode I <laughs> it's just non-stop non-stop talking oh man it uh it takes takes the wind out of my lungs but I hope that that was helpful I know it was a little bit all over the place I just wanted to give you as many tips as I could and I hope that if you are moving soon that it goes smoothly and uh yeah wishing you wishing you the best on your new move and if you're not moving soon like I said maybe You can refer back to this episode or hold on to a couple tips for when you do. But yeah, I think that's it. Thanks for listening. And um, let's get into, oh, we've got a quotable and we've got an iTunes review of the episode. So a quotable, this was submitted from Helpster Joseph. Um, Social media is just moments of celebration. Yeah. Yep. I, uh, I agree with that. It's not always right. I mean, I think, of course, we see tragic things on social media, too. But I do think it's helpful for us if you get into that compare despair trap to remember that social media a lot of the time is a highlight reel of people's lives and people are not always showing you their low lows. Like I said, with the dementia episode, it's like I kept that to myself for two years. I was posting stuff online of, you know, any positive things in my life, but I didn't want to uh, share that very personal private part of my life with the internet and yeah you just never know you never know so even if you think somebody is just like kicking ass and have a perfect life or something you know I think we see certain people online and we're like oh man we we feel jealous or something of of what their life looks like just know that everybody's got stuff going on be kind to people you know we just we don't ever know So yeah, I I agree that social media can definitely be a whole collection of moments of celebration. Uh, Thank you for submitting that, Joseph. If you want to be able to submit a quotable to the show, you can go to patreon.com slash selfhelpless and become a patron. It's such a great community there. We have like over 60 bonus episodes. Uh, If you're looking to binge the show even more than the 300 plus episodes we already have, please go sign up for that. And we also have an iTunes review of the episode. This is from Elizabeth Oliver. Um, it says, new listener, love it. I am binging older episodes and love the book reviews. The girls are relatable and real. Keep it up. Happy New Year. Oh, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Yeah, book reviews. I've been thinking about that, that maybe 
maybe we should bring some of those back. We haven't done a book review in a little bit, but uh, yeah. Thank you guys for tuning in to this solo episode. Again, please go watch my special, The Hustler. It's on YouTube. It's on my website, KelseyCook.com. And my tour dates are there. I will be in Rosemont and Chicago and Denver coming up, Uncasville, Salt Lake City, Burbank. So many tour dates. And uh, yeah, hope you guys are having a wonderful week. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the Self Helpless Podcast. You can find our Patreon community, merch, and our individual work at selfhelplesspodcast.com. We'd be thrilled if you shared this episode with a friend or feel free to post it on Instagram and tag at selfhelplesspodcast so we can repost you and say thank you. 